to talk about something interesting. Madoka episode 2 opens with the introduction of Mommy again, or the reintroduction of her. Uh, it calls back to some of the early episodes of traditional magical girl shows like Lyrical Ninoha and Sailor Moon, where they would have this introduction in the beginning of the show each episode. Of course, in this time with the inversion that Mommy's the center here, and Madoka is still not a magical girl. There's a quick shot of Madoka being startled and turning around, which I don't really have a reading for, other than that it adds to her confusion as she wakes up. Although it very well may be laying the groundwork for Madoka turning around to look at Mommy later in this episode. Her waking up, again, very reminiscent to the start of other shows like Codcaptor Sakura when she has that intense dream and then wakes up. And obviously on that surface level it functions as a cute little joke as Kyubei is on her shelf with all the stuffed animals. But keep in mind this is how Madoka Episode 1 opened as well. In this way it's doing what we've said multiple times already of calling back and invoking these magical girl references but also is putting a twist on them, that this happens again, that it happens with Mommy. Uh, it's implying the recursion, which obviously is a large part of, you know, the plot of Madoka. But so too, the very act of this being a recursive show is, in effect, calling back to the fact that it is a recursive show for the genre. And this scene is a great example of that, that it is invoking these things that you've seen before, but it's also invoking the things that you've seen before already in this show. It's and we can certainly talk more about this in like episode 10 or something, but that Madoka Magica is a continuation of all magical girl shows. And Madoka waking up repeatedly is in fact the exact same continuation of Sakura or Nanoha waking up repeatedly. I think that's really important when we talk about the things that happened in episode 12 about the whole force of the wish Madoka makes. And it's one of those real relevant moments that's kind of beneath the surface for when we talk about who enjoys this or how people enjoy this. If you don't have that background of watching Sakura wake up from her dream where she's the main heroine and then see this thing where Madoka makes up from the dream where Mommy is the main heroine, then you kind of miss out on the other half of what's going on here. Yeah, you can still get the internal recursion within Madoka, but you're not going to get that whole genre recursion that it's invoking as well. In this first minute too, I also want to point out the really hard tonal clash on how Mommy resolves it and we talked about Credence Justitam in the previous video, so if you haven't seen episode 1.5, uh, definitely go back and check that out. But the gist is that the music doesn't really match what's going on on screen or what we would expect to go on on screen. Like, take for example that uh, Cardcaptor Sakura thing that it's clearly referencing here, where it's just Cardcaptor Sakura standing transformed looking at the Tokyo Tower. And even her later dreams don't have any type of action or the level of severity that this does. That Mami launches this full-on barrage of all these gunshots that are really harsh, and then there's explosions and fire and this exceedingly dark background. And that's all coupled with this other side of the coin, this imagery that really says, oh, Mommy is this traditional magical girl and she's painted in that light, including the swelling beats of Credence Justitam, the structure of her lines and her cube sound effects as it jumps into her arms. I mean, even structurally and plot-wise, this wake-up joke and then realize that everything did actually happen is exactly what happens in Card Capture Sakura episode 2. Beat for beat, everything that happens after they wake up is almost exactly identical, including the joke. Except they're so completely different because of the tone. It's kind of exactly the same level of oddity that we find in the OP, but we went over that in episode 1. However, now with the introduction of Mommy's uh, magical girl outfit, the um, ending of the opening seems a little more realistic and tangible and reachable. But also to say that continuing on with the recursion theme, we get the same setting as episode one here with Madoka and Junko talking in front of the bathroom mirror. And again, we have a recursive scene featuring an image of recursion. Now, what's the most important thing that you would think would be from this scene? That ordinary people can't see Kyube, right? Which we could get further into the more specifics of, but that's neither here nor there. It's whatever. It's a contrivance for the plot. It may have some symbolic weight, like Junko is past the the time when she was able to see Kyubei, or she's expressing thoughts that show that she's past the age
age where Kyubei would want to target her. That's all stuff that, you know, can bring up and maybe has some room for analysis, maybe not. But I think that's not actually the most important thing that happens in this scene. The most important thing that happens is that Chunko says Madoka was out late and reprimands her, telling her next time to give them a call and let them know where she is. But actually, that's not even the most important thing. The most important thing is that Madoka doesn't tell Junko what happened in full. A lie of omission and completely understandable, as who knows if Junko would believe her or not, but a willing decision from Madoka, and one that Junko is not happy with. Consider now Junko's scenes from the final third of the series, where she's marginalized, and she's put on the back burner, and she has these scenes where she's upset about it. All she can do is grab onto Madoka and say, Ma are you sure that you're not being deceived? And that's like kind of her final moment of she's done all she can do and now she has to let Madoka go. And that says so much about her character. Sure, she's attentive and compassionate and protective, but it also says so much about Madoka's character. That in spite of this very strong relationship that the two share, she doesn't trust Junko enough for this type of thing. The thing is, and we're skipping forward a little bit, she's absolutely right. The strengths that Junko has as a person and as a character do not align with the problem faced by Madoka. After this flashback, we see the scene where Madoka asks her mom what she would wish for, and without missing a beat, the mom talks about the job, about the politics, and then goes into a uh, scheming kind of plotting, and it's almost hilarious how not relevant it is to the what's going on in the Madoka world. Now, I don't want to be too hard on Junko for this, because I don't think it's a bad example of parenting. In fact, I still think Junko functions very well as a parent in this scene and all throughout the show. However, I do think that we now have our answer of why Junko is not a magical girl, or why she's not able to see Kyubei. Junko is far too logical too pragmatic. And for as much as she clearly loves her family, she certainly doesn't come across as a character who would make an effort to believe in miracles and magic. She's invested in the status quo and playing the game that's presented to her. And as we see her walk out of the scene, and then later on in the episode, as this scene is broken up by Mommy talking in her room to the other two, that we see Madoka alone at the uh, same shot that we saw before. Symbolizing across now uh, six minutes or so that Madoka has to make this decision on her own and Junko is not somebody she can rely on in this aspect, at least. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why Madoka doesn't arrive where she arrives any sooner than she does. I think if you have a kind of like heart catch precure type grandma figure in the Junko role here, or if I think you have a Neo Queen Serenity or any type of like adult magical girl figure who would um, really understand or empathize or that Madoka would feel comfortable sharing the intricacies of the magic stuff that's happening to her, with, then they would give better advice. They would be able to think more broadly, think more about values. And I really do believe that would result in Madoka making a better wish far before episode 11. To conclude, this kind of really drives a wedge into what we can see family as used for in magical girl shows. They can affect the magical girl, provide general help and guidance and things like that, but for the specific issues, for the acts of the plot, that is a trouble for the magical girl to solve by themselves, or in sharing with the others who are involved in it. It's kind of like a model car derby or something. Your chow garden races. Once you, as the parent, have constructed the person as best they can, you can only arm them with the ability to handle the things that'll come up in their lives themselves. You can't handle everything for them. That's kind of Junko's major issue over the course of this show. It's real, it's tangible, it's not something you can fight against, uh, but Junko's personality is one that kind of has trouble letting go of that. And I think the reason that the character of Junko has this personality, or that she was given this personality by Geno Rabuchi is so that we can talk about that kind of thematic triumph of faith, hope, and love, compassion, and understanding, and all that jazz over the raw logic. But also to very much, to the viewer, obfuscate where the show is going to go. If you talk about wishes on the scale of how much they affect or how much good they do unto the world, then Sayaka and Madoka's mom and uh, Kyoko's wishes are very small. 
all, uh, you know, mommies too, but that was a different circumstance. They're very contained. And I think setting this up early with Madoka's mom is very good for the course of the wishes that we are going to see played out in this series, but also for the course of this episode. Indeed, that's what Sayaka is going to be talking about later on, right? There's a really great thing that I like to point out whenever I can called Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. It's a complete work, a book, a uh, fan-made, and you can read it for free on the internet. But the premise is just what if Harry Potter was entirely rational? If he was raised by an Oxford professor and was like a little Spock. And the premise is sort of the same as what Madoka is asking Junko in this scene. If you had virtually unlimited power, what would you choose to do with it? And it really comes down to the same issue here that Sayaka and Junko and whoever else kind of struggle with. How broad can you make your perspective on doing something good? In the end, you get to these kind of high-minded concepts of removing aging, removing death. But that's so abstracted. It's so hard for anyone to really relate to that. And that's kind of where Madoka is as a character for these next two episodes. And to the show's credit, with Sayaka's upcoming monologue and Mommy's warnings, that's where the viewer is, too. But to close out this scene, we're just going to see that Junko is going to be no help in that type of thing. She's an assertive businesswoman, not not a philosopher or a magical girl goddess. Finally, before we move on, one last little bit here. Kyubei is relaxing in the water. This is a disarming shot for the viewer, implying that Kyubei takes pleasure and has emotions and feels happiness. While technically it may, we don't know the hygiene rituals of the incubator race, nor do we care, what's most unsettling seeing this now, knowing what happens later in the show, is that its mouth betrays what its intentions are. We see that ooh kind of cat mouth, and we think it to be a cute smile, but we know that it's not happy. So this shot, whether to deliberately mislead us, the viewer, or to deliberately mislead Madoka into thinking it is a docile creature, maybe both, who knows, is very good. Of course, the directing choice employed to make this clear that it is a flashback is one setting it after Madoka said she went over to a friend's house yesterday, but then also, you know, cutting these shots of her brushing her teeth in between her walking back with Mommy and Sayaka to Mommy's apartment. It's good. It's effective. And I'd also like to point out the bouncy rhythm of the background music here gives it a motion forward. Also, check out the perspective of this shot as they enter the apartment. It's very far away, almost as if they're being watched by someone. As Kyubei's immediately in the next shot inside the apartment, uh, there's only one person left who would be watching them, and it's very likely Homura. Very subtle, but very, very good. Let's very quickly acknowledge here that the insides of Mommy's apartment were one of the things that was drastically changed in the Blu-ray release of Madoka Magica. I see this more as a production thing of they just weren't able to finish it in time. But there could be a lot to be said about how it is changed. The original room is far too Spartan. Though it is clean and nice, it makes Mommy seem emotionless. Honestly, the closest comparison I would make is Yuki Nagato's apartment in the Haruhi franchise. However, Mami is decidedly not an emotionless alien AI, so it only makes sense that they'd fill it out with things that a girl would have. Mami's no different from any other ninth grader in this regard. She's not empty and dead inside, so her room shouldn't reflect that. A good change. For our purposes here, I don't think we need to go into too much depth about Kyubei's explanation in the next couple of scenes. It's really just introducing the characters and the viewer to the plot. I think the pacing is really helped by the cuts back into um, Madoka getting ready in the morning and then them walking to school, but the information is pretty much just a dump. Remember when we said about the setting earlier is that we need to make it so that we don't have to explain certain things. Well, this is the stuff that we do need to explain because it informs how the characters are going to act in the future. Let's first then talk about the intricacies of the plot elements for Madoka Magica and why Gen Urobuchi chose to use them. And then we can talk about how it is um, changing our expectations of what a magical girl show should be. So first we have the soul gem, which is loading the Chekhov's gun for episode six. We have the idea of the monster of the day enemies causing nebulous bad things to happen to people, but it's directly related here to suicides and murders and objectively evil stuff. So even if they looked like the monsters of the day of yore, that we would still know that these are not just little fairies making everything sweet like in that one episode of Cardcaptor Sakura, but instead things that, oh, actually really need to be 
dealt with. Stakes are a really important thing, and we'll talk about that over the course of the series. And we kind of have the uh, nebulous emotional attachment of the magical girls and the witches. Uh, Kibe says magical girls bring uh, hope, and then witches bring despair. And this kind of goes along, too, with the whole conceit of, oh, you know, the emotions of uh, teenage girls changes everything about everything and have unlimited power. This can seem ridiculous, but if we're magical girl fans and we're um, familiar with stuff like the magic system in Do Re Mi, based entirely around people's emotions, then I think you're more willing to accept the fact that negative emotions are tangible and can affect people. And the magic system in this show, and uh, many other shows, is really just codifying that. This goes along with what we see at the end of episode two of the lady trying to do suicide and mommy saving her and influencing her to have hope in that way. It's also a large part of what makes Homer transgressive, right? She's a magical girl who doesn't inspire hope and kind of breaks down that one-to-one -one association. However, from a certain perspective, she does inspire hope, and she does fulfill what Mommy says here. It's just that you have to pull it back far enough that you are able to see it. This goes right into the other point that Urobuchi wrote into the story, that the grief seeds are the currency, and there's a reward for getting the witch, and that's the whole thing with Kyoko of letting the familiar live, and the associations with livestock, and all that stuff that we'll get to later. It's a misdirection on how we're going to misinterpret Homer's intentions for the majority of the show. Basically, pragmatically, the world is not set up in a way that allows love and justice and to triumph easily. In fact, that's all conceit of Madoka Magica, that it doesn't happen just by throwing down your sword and saying, I don't need a sword and reaching out your hand. It still, of course, does happen like that. It's just a whole lot more rigged against you. And in fact, this is in its own way an exaggeration of, you know, every Magical Girls series. That, yeah, it is difficult to maintain those ideals, to believe in justice, and have faith in other people. But just because it's more difficult to do that in the world that Gen Urobuchi has whipped up here doesn't mean that it's any less meaningful or less powerful when it does happen, or that it doesn't happen in exactly the same way. It definitely, definitely does. That said, and I'm not equivocating here, I definitely want to make a big distinction, there are a number of aspects here that are deliberate inversions on what we would expect. The negative side of being a magical girl is heavily emphasized to the characters before they engage in the act of becoming a magical girl. Now, consider that somebody like Amy Mizuno has three episodes entirely dedicated to how much it sucks to be a sailor soldier, and she doesn't want to. In fact, all the inner soldiers do. However, she's not given it the option up front and told how upsetting it's going to be to have to fight evil every day. She's not told to think about it in those early Sailor Moon episodes when she grabs the pen and transforms. In fact, no magical girl is given that, even if they do come to realize it later on. Even a magical girl who is given the option, such as Duck, isn't sat down and as the sun sets, told to drastically consider how bad this lifestyle is going to be, even if you are making a positive influence on the world. I think this is one of the reasons why this episode is tough for people who don't have a background in Magical Girls. When I'm watching this through the first time, I'm chewing on this. I'm thinking like, why are they doing this? What are they trying to say about, you know, the negative aspects of this lifestyle? If you're just an anime fan, this just seems like another magic system and another exposition dump. Last quick shot before we move on here. What is up with this composition? This is a Shinbo-ass composition. Do we say sort of subtle visual hint that she's going to be torn in half later on? Do we say that it reflects uh, like looking in the mirror or Mado what Madoka sees when she looks into the mirror as it fades into the next shot as Mommy continues to talk over it? Are we being voyeuristic in some way? Or are we setting Mommy up as kind of this paragon of stability who is so high above us? While a lot of detail is added, this shot is maintained from the original airing. So I think something's maintained. I'm just not entirely sure what. Finally, can I just say how much I really do love somebody talking over a transition? I know it can feel super cheesy if you do it wrong, but it's such a powerful tool if you do it right. And I would say a hundred people out of a hundred would get the idea that Mommy's words are echoing inside Madoka's head the next morning. Pressing on, pressing on. We're back again with the repetition and the same song and the same place of Madoka catching up with Sayaka and Hitomi. Show something once and it should have meaning. Show something twice and you know it's important. 
For the next bit too, I'd like to point out the translation here. Um, Sayaka refers to Kyubei as a him. In Japanese, she uses a pronoun that doesn't have a gender, soitsu. That said, I think it's a good translation. And if you're translating it into English, we would really say nobody can see him. But it's just a good time to mention that Kyubei's voice actor in both Japanese and English really does the whole alien genderless thing pretty well, while still managing to sound something like Luna and Yuno and all the precure fairies and what have you. Let's also explain and by doing so completely ruin the joke of this scene, which is one of my favorite things to do. Check my Nietzsche Joe breakdowns. Those don't exist and won't exist. But this joke is relevant for not only being a very good pacing thing that keeps the exposition dump from being exposition dumpy, but also giving us a lot of information on Hitomi. And Sayaka, for that matter. Hitomi goes off on some delusion of grandeur like something out of a romance novel. The joke is that we know it's magic, but that Hitomi's actually being more realistic because a romance like that would be more likely to happen than magic. While saying it out loud makes the next couple episodes seem really stupid, doesn't it? Here's the thing, that's how Hitomi sees the world. Of miracle magic romances happening out of nowhere, right under her nose with her two best friends. It's also entirely meaningful that Madoka says Hitomi's acting like Sayaka today. I mean, considering the action Sayaka is going to take over the course of the next couple episodes, it makes sense that she's portrayed as fanciful when it comes to romance. I guess you could even consider this causality event zero in this timeline, right? This mis understanding, while funny, while everything that we've already acknowledged, is also kind of enabling Hitomi to move forward with pursuing Violin Boy. More generally, her behaviors and uh, comparing it to Sayaka is normalizing the idea that these two are fans of that type of romance, or they think about things in that way. Also, let's give a little nod to the lesbian aspect here. Eerie undertones are far from foreign to magical girl shows, so it's a funny call out, but then if you consider that both of these characters uh, Sayaka and Madoka are kind of canonically paired off. Well, canonically, oof, that's a whole can of worms that we can get into later and in Rebellion and whatever. But they are both have these relationships that are very intimate with other females. And while I think girls can't love girls, the English translation is kind of bad? I mean, it's a bit more subtle in the Japanese. I think it's really funny that when they're accused of having lesbian relationship, neither Madoka or Sayaka give any type of negative reaction to that. Whereas for Hitomi, that's a complete non-starter. The only other thing I want to talk about before we get to the roof scene is kind of the positioning of Homura as an outcast. Uh, the bring up the question of will she attack Kyubei and kind of break that social non-aggression pact. Ugh. Speak of the devil. It goes back to communication, right? They don't communicate with Homura deliberately for her own reasons but that allows them to kind of paint her as the enemy. Useful for the story and understandable based on the timelines that she's been through. But it's just, there's so many scenes uh, through all these magical girl shows where uh, the main character will be like, why can't we talk this out? Why can't we resolve this not through fighting? Do we have to fight? It's kind of a staple thing, right? So here we're kind of expecting something like that to go down. One of the juicy nuggets that we want to save for later on in the series when it is more relevant is the question of whether or not Homer did anything wrong. And memes aside, I think that discussion is a larger part of uh, what makes Madoka Magica interesting as a show. However, I just want to say right now that it's very clear that Homura is a misunderstood magical girl. Even the first time through, it's very clear that's the case. She's not portrayed as an evil character. Um, we had a comment on the last video from an anonymous YouTuber who said, why do you think the characters are all mostly white with other colors layered on? And that brings up a great part about the design, that they're designed as the Holy Quintet, that they're all designed as from the same basis. They're supposed to be matching parts of a set. And Homer's portrayal throughout the series hasn't shown her to be actively evil. Her uh, desires are obviously aligned against the group, but she's not off-putting or scary or monstrous or creepy or anything really like that. She's stoic, and Mommy said she's powerful. But it's kind of clear through the intro to episode one, through her design, through everything, that she's going to be one of those characters that's introduced and then becomes an ally later on. I think if you want a great example of how you're expecting to read Homura, it's really easy just to boot up any season of, like, Symphagear or something 
and then point out the enemies and just say, oh, okay, those are the guys that are going to have opposing views and be placed against the characters for the beginning of the season, and then kind of things are going to change, and their motivations are going to change, and perspectives are going to change, and then they're going to realize that they're actually on the same side, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And whether they have a happy ending or not, that doesn't really matter. They're going to get redeemed. And of course, this happens in a ton of magical girl shows, but the figure makes it just so fucking obvious. And because that's such a well-worn trope, and the show is honestly playing it straight, there's no cause for alarm, and there's no need to be afraid of Homura. Her only actions are attacking Kyube and refusing to explain herself and show herself to the other girls. That's just all to say, this mystery aspect, with everything Homura has going on, that we're not privy to as viewers, and Madoka isn't privy to, that's all deliberately, by the tone of the show, put off into the background. It's hinted at, it's loaded these Chekhov's guns, but it's positioned in a way that you won't have to give a lot of thought to it. Which is great and intentional, because what you're supposed to be thinking about right now is the very next scene, and the philosophical kind of questions that were posed earlier in the episode, and then Sayaka is going to reiterate on the roof. I really, really want to get to this roof scene, but before that, we have to acknowledge that the teacher is talking about active and passive verbs, and neither Madoka nor Sayaka are listening. And uh, over the course of the next couple episodes, you can kind of see the flaws of those two kind of being on the different ends of the spectrum there. Sayaka is far too active and takes the initiative on Kyosuke, using her wish when it's a bad idea, actively setting her own self up by her actions. Madoka is a character who has things happen to her. She's objectified by Homer's actions and kept into the passive voice. That's a kind of interesting dichotomy that really has a lot more going for it, too. Like, there was large discussions of why Madoka is such a boring character and a bad main character, and what Sayaka's main mistake was. But I think we'll get to those in time. Uh, for right now, let's just remember that when the rain scene comes at the bus stop and Sayaka yells at Madoka, that it's kind of a very uh, core of their argument that one is active and the other is passive and they're both stuck in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Finally, we've arrived on the roof. Uh, interestingly, tonally, obviously, very clear, very freeing, very open. The birds flying off in the first shot and the rich blue of the skies really give it a great clarity. But look at this establishing shot. Through that clarity, there's this heavy iron weight on top of the both of them. It's the only thing that's in focus and in the scene when Sayaka starts talking about a wish. To keep going with the visual metaphor here, the Sayaka is blown by the wind, whether that's implying her to be capricious or that she she's free or that she's light, maybe anyone, maybe all of those. The other very, very clear visual metaphor here is that she uh, puts her hands up to the chain link fence and in the Blu-ray version, a what looks much more like bars on a prison cell. However, she's never shown from the opposite perspective of them. So while they are on a sort of a cage up here, it's from inside the perspective of the cage in sort of like that famous Avatar scene where it's shot from inside Uncle Iroh's prison cell and it makes him seem like the one who is free versus his nephew who is outside the cell but actually shot in a way that imprisons him. I think this setting here really gives the impression that there is this endless sky above them, that there is this weight that uh, is pressing down upon them, and there is this kind of barrier to fulfilling that infinite possibility. Also, the Blu-ray change away from the chain link fence really makes for a much better, clearer picture, and which is again why I think it's one of those time-saving measures that was corrected when they had a little more breathing space in the production. So anyway, onto Sayaka's dialogue. Obviously, she's definitely talking about Kyosuke. She's kind of floating this idea out there that is it okay to make a wish for someone else? She can't find any concept that she'd willingly give her life for, even though she acknowledges those do exist, but it's heavily implied that she has a person who she'd give her life for. So I guess this is kind of the first time we get to crack open that nut and judge the characters of the show. Do we say Sayaka is foolish, is an idiot? Maybe, kind of. It's not without reason and completely understandable, though. Isn't it just and righteous to sacrifice yourself for the sake of someone else? 
Isn't that what Kyoko, Madoka, and Homura all do? And even in the final episode, when Madokami offers her the chance to undo it, she still chooses not to. There's a lot of actions over the course of this show that we can judge as the morality police, but I think that's missing the point. The point, as ever, is empathy. Not so much logic and optimizing the most return on your wish versus the least amount of pain, but instead knowing and understanding others' feelings feelings and why they chose to do what they did and respecting that. And that's exactly how Madoka treats Homura. Of course she can't answer Madoka's request for telling her her wish. I just think it's funny that in the past I've done these and I've been like, well, if they had only done this right here, then things in this story would have been completely different. But that actually is addressed in episode 10. It's really the only way that a plot based around the lack of communication and deliberately withholding information can work. But this is one of those points, I think, uh, one of those uh, pressure points where the show steers clear of coming back to being a normal magical girl show. Leaving this scene, I'd like to acknowledge that Homer again entered from the top middle of the screen and left via the top middle as well. Also, aside from her, very little movement in this scene, which, you know, makes sense with the characters stuck thinking about things. And at last, we get the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite things, Morning Rescue. Rescue! Kashi! Morning Rescue! Nah, I'm just fucking with you, but it was funny that they left in these commercials for the original TV airing and codes. We get a repeat of the Hitomi joke from earlier, kind of furthering it as actually not a joke and really what she perceives, which is good for her actions on Kyosuke. And we get Homura creeping, coupling that with how she only addressed Madoka in the previous scene, how it flashed to a full screen of Madoka's face when Homura is asked what her wish was. We can kind of infer that whatever she has going on is directly related to Madoka. Also, I think the show's really mean here. We already touched on how Kyube was bathing earlier, how it has the little smile, but in these back-to-back -back scenes, it's also shown eating and enjoying eating. That's a character much closer to Artemis than it is to the dispassionate Yuki Nagato that it is later in the series. One of the show's greatest wins is the deception on Kyube. How that is going to be the trope that is inverted. To the credit of the creatives, though, we can really see how the character could be influencing this. We'll give Kyube the benefit of the doubt that it is putting up a facade to be able to trick these characters. I do think one of the fun things about Kyube is that it mentions later on that it never lied. And even in the previous scene when it stated that magical girls usually jump on the chance to make a wish and become a magical girl, it's probably not lying there either, as it's really the transgressive actions of Homura that keep this from going back to one of those shows. I'm just imagining Usagi staring up at that poster of Sailor V in the first episode of Sailor Moon, wishing to be a superhero and wishing for a miracle romance. Romance. Or Duck, who only wants to have this relationship with the prince, but ends up being burdened by the day-to-day -day problems of the characters. It's more than they bargain for because they never bargain for it. That's all that Homer in this timeline and the show in general are trying to do right now. Thrusting the negative aspects or the trade-offs of being a magical girl front and center really does put a damper on those types of things. Disassociating and parsing all the separate elements that are almost universally packaged into one in a traditional series. In the next scene, we get the couple of these really good character beats. Sayaka, again, very prepared, actually aware, knows that maybe the bat won't do anything, but she's ready to fight. She's ready to buy into the dichotomy of witches evil fight witches. Madoka's ready to buy into the concept of being a magical girl for the magical girl's sake. She, again, kind of has this Usagi moment of, wouldn't it be great to be a fancy heroine? These two preparations tell us all we need to know about the characters or how they view the the onset of the magical girl world. Compare this action with Saika's dialogue on the roof, and it's very clear that she's a rebel without a cause. She's ready to fight, but she has no battle or no stakes in the battle. She just needs a line drawn in the sand to tell her what's right and what's wrong. Madoka is on the other side of the spectrum. She generally has an idea of what's right and wrong, and the morality that she is dealing with, or that we talked about all in the first episode, really sets her up as being equipped to be the normal magical girl and understand what that means 
and embody that, but she's not prepared at all for the situation that she's in in her Magical Girl story. Unfortunately for her, Shaft is the studio making this show, not Madhouse. While great, there's a third element to this scene. Mommy. How quickly she embraces this role of, hey, I'm going to introduce you to this. She refers to um, Madoka and Sayaka as her kohais, uh, or her Magical Girl trainees in the fight against Gertrude. And this whole scene, it kind of showcases her joy at having this happen to her. Of course, with her dialogue in episode 3, she kind of surfaces that, but it's good to see it in action before that. In the next bit, the lighting in Kajiro's music is very strong, very tonally appropriate, but the directing is simple, and it lets us focus on what Mommy is saying. However, this scene had substantial changes in the Blu-ray release, just because it is fucking ugly in the original one. The Blu-ray gives us these lovely kind of panels made by the bars in the bridge. The fact that they're white and they mesh with these intersecting lines of red in the background give us the feeling reminiscing back to the um, roof with Sayaka holding onto the bars. But instead of being free inside the cage, now they're kind of more trapped inside the cage. The big part of this scene is the long lingering shot on Madoka when she realizes that Mommy let the witch get away to save them. That decision troubles her in a way that it doesn't trouble Sayaka just because of what we said already. That's an impossible decision. That's something that Madoka realizes is going to have to be a choice. One that she's not sure that she can make. Sayaka can make it though because she's simplified it. She, not Mami, calling herself this, she calls Mami an ally of justice. Seiji no Mikata. It's not much of a secret that that's a direct reference to previous magical girls. Here's Chibiusa identifying Usagi as one in the Sailor Moon R movie. A guardian of justice doesn't cry. You really are an ally of justice, mommy. So again, two back-to-back -back scenes that meaningfully express the ideas in their heads and how they think about the world. When you talk about good writing, when we say, show me, not tell me, this is exactly what we're talking about. Why do we believe that Sayaka meets a different fate than Madoka? Well, it's because they think about the world differently and their actions are going to be different. Because we saw it all in these episodes. It just takes a bit of time for the plot to catch up to the point where they're going to directly conflict in the rain. And if you would have sat me down and stopped it all right at this point and said, Clear and Sweet, what do you think is going to happen to Sayaka in this part? I was going to say, oh, she's going to meet some tragedy because she's thinking about the world in far too black and white. That's shown when she mentions Homura. She doesn't refer to her by name. She uses the words to piss me off, but the shot of Homura turning around here doesn't have any type of filter or warping or any type of setup that would allow it to be read in any other way than just a normal girl. Of course, this is implied to be Madoka's perspective by her her face coming in on the next shot, but her equivocation there on, uh, I wonder, is a third element, a third example differentiating the two's mindset. A final word from this scene, in the Blu-ray version as they go over this bridge, they're again walking and they're again kind of not moving anywhere on the screen, so it implies that type of effort but no progress. As opposed to the roof scene, now they're actually doing something, they're walking, they're taking an action, but they're not any closer to solving this riddle. In the next scene, our friend Goethe's back with Faust. This, unlike the runes, is written very clearly in German, which means you'll be able to interpret it on your first go-through, and I believe this was used to go back and decode the uh, runes to kind of figure out if we were talking about Goethe in that first uh, shot of the series. But here it's front and center, it's asking you to go online and interpret this German. So now we know what we're dealing with, we know this is a story about making a deal with the devil, about being dragged off to hell, about the feudal struggle of the human condition and eternally failing. Sure, we don't have the full context yet, but now we have a pretty good taste of the references the show wants to invoke. The translation of this is, um, well, it'd be an understatement to say it's open for uh, interpretation. Let's look at it um, at a glance from somebody who could speak German. I mean, I look at it and all I see is, okay, that's German. However, my friend Block here might have a different perspective. Is, is that from, from Faust? Yeah, yeah, this is the Madoka quote in Faust episode 2. Should I just translate the whole thing? No, I have the translation right here. It's on the internet. Oh, okay, I just wanted to um, kind of talk about, like, when you're looking at this, what are you seeing first? And, like, because I'm just seeing it and I'm going, oh, it's German. Uh, but you're seeing mm -hmm. it and you can understand the words. So I think those three at the end there kind of really pop out because of the way the shot's structured. 
Um, yeah, they're bigger and mm -hmm. they're brighter. Like the other ones, they kind of merge in with the background because of like the yeah, like the little contrast. So those are the ones that stick out. They're also more spaciously written if you look at the font. Yeah, like as if someone wrote them and like they got bigger towards the end. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, zerschlagen to destroy, to shatter, nichts hinüber. Ah, uh, die Trümmer. Nichts ist Nothingness. Uh -huh. And hinüber is like over. Like die Trümmer ins Nichts hinüber, they carry over the uh, the shattered pieces. Yeah. Like okay. over into nothingness. The Nichts hinüber. Ins Nichts hinüber means like over into nothingness. Into nothingness. They well, carry them into nothingness. That that seems very strong for me. Or the first symbol that jumps out for me is the grief seeds of the witches. The witches labyrinth comes up. So. That kind of that kind of feels to me like grief seeds. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final line there, you said shown is beauty. Uh, what's the final line? Uh, the the beautiful, not beauty, like a person. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I mean, actually, I mean, I mean, this is not contemporary Germans. Like they might have used it differently, sure. but to my like my German knowledge, that would mean like und klagen über die verloren and they yeah they they moan over the the lost beauty like as yeah. in the beautiful person and like a, a woman most likely okay so yeah we have those, uh, and definitely a woman. so we have those three concepts right of of it shattering and then um these fragments of the emptiness or nothingness um, i don't know like they, they carry the fragments into the nothingness oh okay like gotcha i don't know what that means but like <laughs> oh yeah it's like, it Kragen literally means carrying like they take them in their hands and they carry them and they bring them into nothingness and hinuba means like hinuba is literally like over there like not over there but like like you are in place b and you carry them into place and you are in in, in position a and you carry them into position b like there's mm. a strong directionality it's like gotcha. th they are not in the nothingness but they go into nothingness that's why i said over like uh, you would use that to say like go over a street gotcha like, it's, it's over literally like uber literally means over so like it's like sure. go over the street go over that into that direction something like that okay so going over into the void and the the final line there um in full um have... about the beauty yeah uber die yeah, and they, they, I don't know if moan is the right word, moan, lament, like, mm -hmm. sure. like when someone dies and you go to their funeral, like, yeah, no, moaning is the word, yeah. and they moan over um, the lost beauty and so, beauty being a person. Yeah, so that, uh, that, or, or, yeah, that really strikes me as the behavior of a witch that they're they're shown multiple times to be like yelling or crying and then if they're they're transporting these fragments of a shattered you know something in in and in a void or in a nothingness and then uh moaning the lost beauty um of the of their state as a magical girl that's that's how i'm choosing mm -hmm. to read this it, I don't know, are you getting something different or I I mean I, I don't really know the text, so but yeah, like it sure. says it's, Well the context is that these are like in a, a choir that's taunting um Faust. Mm -hmm. So about he, like a woman? Yeah, well I mean he loses Gretchen, right? I, I don't fucking know. Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't read that in in modern German class? No. My my grandpa always complained about that we we read other stuff though. Okay. So would would you say an average German person nowadays or in 2011 would n see this and be like, that's Faust? Or would they be like, what the uh, fuck is this old German nonsense? Probably like if they're not my generation, but like if they're older, like 25 gotcha. upwards, I would, I would expect it. But yeah, it, it says, Halb God has it such long, it's like a, a demigod shattered her. I don't yeah. know if that's. Yep. Yep. Okay, okay. Yep, that's that's yeah, what we got in the translation. 
Okay, okay. Yeah, that's one episode is that again two? Yeah, that's two. Yeah. And then this was kind Slowly of slowly working your way through. As the scenery gets darker and darker here, it really does feel like the pace of the show and Mommy explaining everything and them walking in multiple scenes shows how long it takes and how much of an effort it is. Mommy's talking about checking multiple places, going to intersections, uh, districts, hospitals, actively hunting witches. This is, in fact, another kind of uh, lampshade or inversion on magical girl tropes in general because what would happen in a magical Magical girl show is that you know something would happen right in front of the wherever the magical girl was you know like in in an episodic format you have the action just appear right where they are that's obviously ridiculous and you know leads to such things of like why does all the bad guys come right into the tokyo district where sailor moon lives and this is one of the actual inversions that the show does do to the traditional magical girl tropes but it does it for a reason to show that being a magical girl requires that much effort. We see that later when Sayaka goes out to hunt winches. It's making that other side of the coin of like, you know, becoming this heroine seem even less appealing. This is without a doubt my favorite directing sequence in this episode. Cutting from places to commit suicide to the empty high heels, the intense motion to what has been originally a static episode, and the parallax of the clouds going by as the victim's hair flutters. There's a great bit of verticality too. And I particularly like how the transformation sequence takes place in real time and it doesn't like cut away back to her original transformation. Those small kind of logical edits that keep popping up again and again are what make this show feel distinct from normal magical girl shows. We'll notice now that the shot pacing has picked up drastically in tune with the music. The shot of the witch's labyrinth at the top of the stairs mirrors what we saw from episode one. The transformation on Sayaka's bat mirrors the witch's kind of amorphous blob type aesthetic. And also I think it's fantastic that the bat doesn't become cool or jagged or something that you would think about swinging things. No, magic makes things frilly and have ornate and very pretty designs. The show makes a very large effort to disorient us here. We've gone from a lot of talking to a lot of movement now, and there's not any time for the show to stop here and explore the familiars and what their properties are and, you know, how to deal with them or anything like that. The pounding bass on the music in the background definitely adds to this, but it all breaks when Mommy kicks that one familiar out and Madoka has this uh, moment of clarity. She's been so wishy-washy this entire episode. That emotional state uh, and it resolving when when she looks at mommy, really puts forward the values that we want to take away here, and that will become relevant in episode three. Confusion and fear and disorientation, all of that kind of phase to the wayside when you have somebody to believe in and trust in. That is something that Madoka can believe in. That's that fertile ground that would support her, e the other people, the always somewhere someone is fighting for you. That is true and righteous and just, and she knows that. Man, Gertrude as a witch is kind of nuts, and a great one to start the show on. She's got this Cthulhu face, and she gets this uh, title screen introduction and border. She's beyond hideous. She doesn't have any type of form that we can identify. She's got motifs of roses and butterflies. Mustaches, that's a weird one. But when Sayaka calls it gross and disgusting, yeah, <laughs> that's what the viewer thinks as well. And Mommy's lines in here are all of straight comedy. I want to save the talk of her fate for episode 3, but I really do think that they've set you up to believe that Mommy dies because she becomes overconfident or wants to show off. That's not the case. If anything, she's entirely pragmatic. She knows how tough this witch is, and she knows that she can easily take it down. She taunts it by stepping on its familiar. She curtsies to draw her weapons out in just the most stylish way possible. That's so cool. And we can almost even consider her getting grabbed a bit of uh, bravado, playing it up for her audience finally. And I mean, just the pacing on the action shows that she does it very well. I think we as audience are also feeling like Madoka and Sayaka in that, wow, she did that and she did that stylishly and she landed the landing <laughs> with a teacup. Maybe if she did make a less of a show about it, uh, Sayaka would be less impressed and she would not do what she does in episode four. I think Mommy's clearly over compensating in this battle. She wants to be liked. She wants to play this role to other people. She wants to not be alone anymore. She thinks this is the best way of convincing those two. 
but instead what she's done is glamorize the idea of fighting witches. I think the whole concept of a grief seed and then the soul gem and the purification that goes back and forth between the two, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, but it's really very interesting that this is the one thing that Urobuchi does not clarify or does not apply logic to. There's deliberately this nebulous and intangible relationship between the emotions of the magical girl, the darkness of her soul gem or how unpure it is or how pure it is, and this kind of quantum quantifiable procedural and logical way to clean it. When killing a witch in front of these girls and then saving this person who attempted this suicide and comforting her later on, that makes Mommy feel happy as a character that she's done something good, like it gives her value, it leaves her fulfilled, it makes her flourish, and it seems to be coincidentally tied to the purification of her soul gem, or that those two are disconnected, but they're not at all. And in fact, when Sayaka, over the course of the series, as she fades uh, further and further down the path of not living up to her expectations and, you know, her mental state degrades, then her soul gem degrades as well, but it's because of the actions that she's taking as her mental state degrades that in the universe's magic system degrade her soul gem's purity. So while they seem disconnected, they're not. The same thing for Homer right before Madoka makes her wish. Yes, she's expended all of her magic energy and she's physically dying, but her soul gem is black and about to shatter because she's emotionally dying. So in that way we can extrapolate this, that the state of the soul gem is the state of the magical girl and her headspace, and that you don't die as a magical girl, you don't uh, um, surrender to the curse of being a witch by using up all your magic and not getting enough grief seeds. That happens as a result of you not finding the purpose anymore or not having the will to go on. In this way, again, it's very Faustian. This is kind of the beautiful element of Madoka Magica. And I want to say that it was um, captured very well in the PSP games and a lot of the video games surrounding Madoka Magica that have come out, you really do kind of capture this idea of magical power tied to uh, life, tied to the person's emotional state. It's also really relevant in episode 12 with Madoka's Wish. Anywho, we'll talk about it further in depth as it comes up again and again. But right now I'd like you just to imagine that grief seeds don't actually have any magic or anything related to that, or don't even think of them as any type of MacGuffin or whatever. Soul gems and purifying them are just a representation of the character's mental state. Because magic in magical girl shows is not anything. It's not, the glamour doesn't matter. It doesn't have any effect on anything. The only thing that matters is the purpose, having the will to go on, having the passion and love and confidence, believing in miracles and magic, and all the good things that we'll talk about over the course of the thing for themes. That's how it always is. That's Usagi with a locket, that's duck dancing, that's everything. That's all and everything that magical girls have always been. The glamour, the fantasy obstructs and complicates things. But the real magic was the friends we made along the way. The philosophies and perspectives that make life worth living. Don't be confused by the coat of paint. In fact, this is my metric on how I judge if a show is a magical girl show or not. Which part wins? The magical or the girl? And that's really what Madoka recaps at the end. In an episode that is mostly entirely about all the functioning mechanics of this world, all the ins and outs and social pressures that you have to adhere to if you're a magical girl, Madoka sees the purpose and the meaning and the value in it. She sees it as an avenue by which she can influence people positively, by which she can spread values of compassion and understanding. Everything else be damned. Thanks for continuing to listen. In episode 3, I really want to get into what causes Mommy's downfall, the value of having somebody beside you, and of course the more general reception of the time the series went off the rails. Stick with us. You're right, but don't let your guard down. Behind you! 